welcome back to our eighth and final week together. In the Lord's kindness, we have persevered to the end of our study of 2 Timothy. Jillian had us celebrate with chocolate in week five, but finishing well deserves at least chips and guacamole. We have finished a micro race in the scope of eternity. We have persevered and finished well done Make sure to have your Bibles and printed guide close by. Today, we get to put some final thoughts together, while yet knowing that overall, we seek to encounter the power of Jesus as his word washes over us, pierces our hearts to repentance, and transforms us. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are kind to reveal your word to us. You are a patient and truthful God that has given us the Holy Spirit to teach us your truth. Thank you for the opportunity to study 2 Timothy. In it, we see that your character remains the same through the ages. Holy Spirit, thank you for your strength so that we could finish the book. You are transforming us in desire for continued sanctification of our souls. I pray these words over us again at the end of study. And this is my prayer, that their love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that they may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Amen. Returning to the table with the word portioned out and ready for us to eat is a privilege, one that we can cherish and not allow duty to cloud its blessing. We have seen the power of the word of God transform us and make us more like Christ. So let's receive it today. Savor it as a delightful morsel for our souls. Last week, Megan led us to a deeper understanding of the word of God's authority in our life and how it is able to transform us as we run the race. And all of this is by the empowering of the Holy Spirit in us. Some of the themes that are found in this passage of scripture are perseverance through suffering and persecution, forgiveness, reconciliation, endurance to the end, godly friendship, reward from God, remember the gospel for you, and God's righteousness. Today's passage will be portioned out in three sections. Section one, a living sacrifice poured out, will be 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8. Section two, Jesus the perfect pattern in friendship, will be 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 15. In section three, Praise the Lord, he is our rescue, will be 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 21. This section of scripture begins with the word for. So let's take some time to read the verse right before this passage to make sure we understand Paul's explanation and request to Timothy. Take a moment and pause the video if you need to get to the passage. In 2 Timothy 4, 5, we see Paul say, As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So Paul has just charged Timothy to be steadfast and continue to preach the gospel despite of sure suffering, because Paul's time here on earth is almost done. Now, let's proceed with the reading of the first section we will be diving into. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, There is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Amen. 
This is the word of God. Imagine your last few weeks of life. What would you be doing? Who would you want to see? What would you want to say? Who would you call to come close? Or who have you meaning to call close and haven't yet? This is where we find the Apostle Paul in this, in this whole letter of 2 Timothy. Yet in this last passage, we see his final words, ones that have echoed with truth for many generations now. At first, you may want to focus on the first three verses and gloss over the list that seem to be all that's left of the letter. In these last few verses, though, you will also find the riches of the gospel, even as Paul's sure death is near. The assuredness of grace from God emanates from the apostle in a way he lived his life, believed Jesus, and cared for his friends. In verse 6, we see that Paul once again uses pictures that are easy for his readers to understand. Paul describes his life as being poured out. He was connecting his life to the sacrifices some of the Jewish believers were familiar with. In the Jewish custom, God gave instructions on when and how to offer sacrifices to him. The sacrifice was made up of different parts. And in the midst of the sacrifice, wine was to be poured out before the altar as the sacrifice burned. It was to make a pleasing aroma before the Lord. Turn with me to Numbers 28, verse 7 and verse 24. Verse 7 says, Its drink offering shall be a quarter of a hen for each lamb. In the holy place you shall pour out a drink offering, a strong drink to the Lord. And then verse 24 says, In the same way you shall offer daily for seven days the food of a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. It shall be offered besides the regular burnt offering, and its drink offering. Paul could have been alluding to the literal type of death that he would suffer soon. As a Roman citizen, Paul could not be crucified, so he anticipated to be beheaded, in which case his blood would splash as the wine on the altar. Just as Christ's blood was poured out for us, Paul now can see his life as poured out offering to Christ. Paul continues to model for us that our lives are not our own. We belong to Christ and to each other. Will this be said of you? Will people at the time of your death say they poured out their life for Christ? I can imagine also that Paul is reminded of how his life has been a living sacrifice before the Lord, that daily he has had to die to himself so that through those deaths, the power of life found in Jesus could be made manifest in him. Paul has invited us to practice this before in Romans 12. In the first two verses of Romans 12, he reminds us that part of our spiritual worship requires that we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. In week six, Laura taught us that we are invited into a covenant with the Lord when she explained the Greek word spendo, to pour out our life as a drink offering. Our bodies are not our own. They are a gift, a useful vessel to do the work of the Lord. But sometimes our bodies seem frail, riddled with pain, and at times downright defective. Even as we are talking about Paul's reminder to pour out our life daily as a living sacrifice, we cannot forget that Paul's body seemed fragile to him too. Three times he asked God to remove a thorn in the flesh, but God replied to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
So then, Paul trusts the Lord with his suffering, with his weak body, with the loss of health, and surrenders to the power of Christ so that it can rest in him. Megan reminded me of Joni Erickson's Tata's life. Have you heard of her? Because of an accident, she became a quadriplegic, and for 53 years, she has been in a wheelchair. Yet she is able to say, our bodies are fragile, but I'm still growing on the inside. Outwardly, I'm wasting away, but my spirit and assurance of salvation is growing, and my love of Jesus is growing. Deep, great trials bring with them deep grace from God, enlarging our soul's capacity for Jesus. Maybe your body is constantly reminding you of your weakness. Maybe the pain is debilitating at times. Maybe the anxiety that overtakes your emotions takes all of your energy too many times a day. But you have a king who has suffered so that you can have eternal life. He comes near to you in your suffering, and he uses your weakness to advance his kingdom. Will you rest in his provision today? In what way do you participate in offering your body as a living sacrifice daily before God? Take some time to write down one way that you sense the Holy Spirit nudging to practically offer yourself as a living sacrifice. The apostle continues in verse 6, The time of my departure has come. This word, departure, in the Greek refers to loosing, a metaphor from loosing the moorings of a boat in preparation to set sail. It is, as, it is as if Paul is recognizing that he is embarking on a new adventure. So he takes time to reflect on his ministry of about 30 years, reflecting on the past, the present, and the future. I love this picture of a joyous departure to a better place. Here he is presently anticipating the long time longing as he shared in Philippians 1.23. Paul says, My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. Here he is. His time has come. He is ready to be united with Christ in death as in life. Are you also ready? As believers, we are all approaching our final days, and that should not scare us. But instead, we can draw comfort from these words. The sufferings we will encounter in this life will not compare to the glory that is to come as we enter the heavenly home prepared for us. Indeed, it is better to be with Christ, so much better. Throughout 2 Timothy, the faithfulness of God has shone brightly. It highlights the truth of life, that God is who he says he is and keeps his promises. Paul believed the Lord and modeled to Timothy to do the same, even as death was imminent. He said in 2 Timothy 2.8, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, the offspring of David, as preached in my gospel. So I encourage you, remember Jesus Christ. Specifically, if this topic of death makes your heart anxious or makes you doubt your salvation, remember Jesus. He also prayed this cup would be taken from him, but walked toward but walked forward in faith and obedience towards his death as he, entrust, as he trusted in God, the Father. Elizabeth Elliot once said, Sometimes the fear does not subside, and you must do it afraid. Ask God to help you move forward in faith, even if you fear death, and ask a friend to join you in prayer as you move ahead. As we move into verse 7, we see that Paul reflects on the past triumphantly. 
he is possibly drawing again from the pictures he gave in chapter 2 from the soldier, the athlete, and the farmer. Because in, chap in chapter 4, verse 7, he states, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. In the first expression, we see Paul as a warrior. Maybe not built like the soldiers he was used to seeing, but his spiritual body and armor are impenetrable. Remember that verse from Ephesians 6 we visited in section 4, where Paul gives us the picture of the armor of God? Well, in that same passage, he gives us insight into his life as a spiritual warrior. Go with me to Ephesians 6, 12. Paul says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Paul knew these battles. He knew them well. He had appeared before kings, rulers, and angry mobs to fight back the darkness with the power of Jesus in him. I can see him writing, torn up with scars, the lines of concentration etched on his face as he charges us to endure suffering. Can you see him? What humbling of heart I experience to hear that charge from one who has suffered so much. In the second expression, we see the athlete again. Paul says, I have finished the race. This has been Paul's ambition from the beginning to complete the race set before him. We all have a race to run. Let us run with endurance, not looking to the right or to the left, but fixing our eyes on Jesus. We do what the writer of Hebrews encouraged us to do in Hebrews 12.1. We set aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and we continue to fix our eyes on Jesus, recognizing that his work completed on the cross is the foundation for the, for the perfecting of our faith. We don't look to ourselves for the gumption, creativity, and strength to finish, but we look to him for all that we need to persevere. Thirdly, Paul says, I have kept the faith. Paul has given us the example of how he guarded the gospel treasure and affirms his faithfulness in doing so here at the end of his life. But throughout the rest of the letter, he also reminds us that it must be passed on, just as he passed it on to Timothy and others. Now we see the work of the apostle can be pictured as fighting a fight, running a race, and guarding a treasure. These require endurance, sacrifice, hard work, and sometimes even peril. But we have a Lord that has already won the victory on our behalf, and we can persevere courageously to end in his strength. Let's look at verse 8 of 2 Timothy 4. There Paul reflects on the future that awaits him. He says, Henceforth, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. This crown of righteousness is a picture that refers back to the garland or crown that was placed on the head of an athlete after winning a race. This doesn't mean that Paul had to wait until death to be deemed righteous. No, he was made righteous when he believed in Jesus. For although the law and the prophets bear witness to the righteousness of God, it is only through faith in Christ Jesus that we can be made righteous today. But one day we will be crowned permanently with righteousness. Even though Paul was being condemned and declared guilty by Nero, Jesus, the righteous judge, would forever declare him righteous and place the crown of righteousness on his head. The beauty of this truth is that, is that it was not only for Paul, but for all who believe in Jesus and long for his coming. 
Have you recognized that your sin separates you from God? Jesus has offered the way to bridge that gap through his death on the cross. Will you receive his gift today? If you have not yet received his gift, take a moment to respond. Open your heart to receive the gift of eternal righteousness that Jesus offers you. When you believe by faith in Jesus, in his first coming as your Savior, you will then eagerly await his second coming. This leads us to our first main truth. Because of Jesus' righteousness, we can finish the race and obtain the crown of righteousness. Let these words give you a vision that you can draw on as you run your race. Jesus is up ahead. You're getting closer. Soon you will gaze upon the one whose body bears the scars of your redemption. His forehead is scarred because he bore the crown of thorns so that you can be crowned with righteousness. Keep going. The Holy Spirit in you strengthens you to persevere. You can persevere to the end. And you will hear those awaited words. Well done, and on your head will be the crown of righteousness that is reserved for you. Let's turn to 2 Timothy 4, 9 through 15, as we move into the second section. Do your best to come to me soon. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, Luke alone is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is very useful to me for ministry. Tychicus I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, also the books, and above all the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. Beware of him yourself, for he strongly opposed our message. This is the word of the Lord. Relationships are hard, aren't they? Friendships, I believe, are the Lord's provision for us here on earth, because we are longing for his presence. For a few years now, the Lord has led me through a valley in which it seems friendships go to die. Now, that sounds really sad and a bit dramatic, but hear me out. I was under the impression that friendships would not come to an end unless there was a conflict or the departing was mutual. Maybe this idea took root because I have lifelong friendships that continue to enrich my life today. It could be that the loyalty that is ingrained in my personality led me to believe that friendships would remain forever. I'm not sure. But I began to shift my gaze from Jesus' friendship to the friendships in my life, and they began to take my attention away from my one true friend. When my friendships began to give way to rejection, albeit unintentionally at times, or the ghostings when a friend vanishes without explanation kept happening, I began to wonder if something was wrong with me. That time of friendships ending without a quarrel, a fight, or even a goodbye tore my heart open and loneliness set in. Gently, the Lord began to pull me back to himself with only his presence. He began to whisper in the words that he had whispered to his disciples right before his death. I have called you friend. Let's look at John 15, 13 through 15. Here Jesus tells his disciples, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. Jesus opens his heart to us in friendship. He laid down his life for us in love and invites us into true friendship. 
what a savior. He not only calls us friends, but also has made known to us all that he has heard from the Father. What a great privilege and responsibility. His, his friendship with us is not passive. We must obey his commands just as he obeys his Father. I believe this is what Paul modeled for Timothy. Just as Paul followed Jesus and obeyed his commands, so Timothy must do as well. Friendships are not only meant to comfort us, but they must also point us back to Jesus as the one we must follow. I repented of exalting earthly friendships over the only friendship that will remain forever and asked the Lord to help me see friendships here for what they are meant to be. How is your view of friendship? Are you lonely, feeling that friends are too hard, and maybe you should just avoid them? How are you putting too many expectations on your friendships? Take some time later to pray. Answer these questions and write down your responses. And bring them before the Lord. Through Paul's ministry, we can see that he consistently mentions two things. In his letters, he mentions Jesus and people by name. He has been abandoned by the ones that he gave his life work to. His close group of traveling companions are absent for different reasons. He is longing so deeply for them and the fellowship that they shared. The dichotomy of relationships is that people can be the greatest source of delight and also the biggest heartbreak all at once. We see this in verse 9. We can almost hear the pain of the desertion when Paul urges, Do your best to come soon, Timothy. And then he shares, For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. We are not sure of why Demas left, but we can see that even though he started out well, he was not able to persevere. Demas did not set his love on Christ's future appearing, but instead he set his love on the world. Paul wants us to learn from this example. We can start out well, we can and will falter, but we don't have to walk away. We have been given all that we need to live a life of godliness before God. Let's turn to 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17. It says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. There is so much to be lost when we love the world and much, much more to be gained when we love Jesus. John John warns us here in these verses that we cannot love Jesus and the world simultaneously. If we love the world, we will desire to change our ministry or treat the Bible in a way that will make us look good to the world. Or we will not be able to stand by Jesus in suffering and will depart from him instead. We see that Demas started out a faithful partner, but did not finish the race. But he was not the only individual mentioned that was either absent or was opposing the gospel. There are nine people mentioned in this list. The next three have gone, but we don't know why they left. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia, and Tychicus is sent to Ephesus. It seems like Tychicus has been sent by Paul on high-responsibility missions before, and maybe this trip to Ephesus has to do with getting Timothy to Paul. Carpus is also mentioned by name, meaning that he must have been a trusted friend because Paul left very valuable items at his house. Although Timothy can collect these items for Paul, his friends, alas, cannot be physically present. 
And if that wasn't enough, Paul also warns Timothy of the great harm Alexander the coppersmith has done to Paul in opposing his ministry. Paul understands that we serve a just God who will not stand for the evil deeds done against his gospel, the oppressed, and the marginalized go unpunished. He will bring justice, just as Paul says in verse 14. The Lord will repay him according to his deeds. The righteous judge that crowns us with righteousness will also judge the world according to their deeds. Besides Luke staying close to Paul, Paul is alone in prison and makes three requests to Timothy. Paul longs for three things, companionship, his cloak for warmth, and his books and parchments for study. Let's talk about, about them one by one. The first request, companionship, has a surprising twist. In verse 11, Paul asks Timothy to get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. This request may seem to be a good and kind thing, but if we take a look back at the history between John, Mark, and Paul, we will see that this is a redemptive request that rings with reconciliation and restoration. Let's turn to Acts 15, verse 36 to 40. On his first missionary journey, Paul's companion was Barnabas, and here we will see why they parted ways. Starting at verse 36. And after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us return and visit the brothers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord, and see how they are. Now Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark. But Paul thought best not to take with them the one who had withdrawn from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them to do the work. And there arose a sharp disagreement, so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. There arose a sharp disagreement. Paul and Barnabas went separate ways. And it seems like the story stops there. Nothing else is mentioned in Acts. And then we come to 2 Timothy and discover that at the end of his life, Paul asked Timothy to get John Mark and bring him, for he is helpful for him. They were reconciled. The work of the Holy Spirit in our heart is the only way we can see reconciliation and true restoration occur in relationships that may seem irreparable. Our God is a God of reconciliation and restoration. Even if the circumstances and time frame deem it impossible, Mark's story should give us hope. Despite his obvious failure that brought upon him rejection, it did not define the end of his story. He was able to repent and return to the work of, that God had for him. Mark became a useful vessel through which the Holy Spirit poured out the book of Mark. The Gospel according to Mark is an action-packed account of Jesus' life that highlights the suffering Messiah. It is this same Messiah that restored him to useful work and can also restore us all from sin to life abundantly. The second request is for Timothy to bring his cloak. Paul is not a superhuman or a superhero. He is human and he is cold. The cloak would serve him well in the cold prison cell he is in. Paul is anticipating the winter ahead and knows that this cloak would be very useful. He is also pleading Timothy to come before winter. The third request is for the books and parchments. Does this seem like a strange request? His death is imminent, and yet he wants to have his books and parchments. Paul is not willing to waste any time. He wants to seize every opportunity to continue the work God has given him to do. He does not let time, circumstances, or age dictate when he stops working for the Lord. 
modeling to us that at every age and in every season of life, the Lord has work for us to do. Let's imitate Paul and use the time we have on this earth well and pour it out to the Lord. He also wants to continue working on his study of the word and writings. He is not giving up his nourishment from the word of God. He needs it to sustain him until the very end. Do we see the word of God in the same way? As a nourishing, essential part of our life? The word of God is able to help us die well, just as it helps us to live well. This leads us to our second main truth. Jesus is the perfect friend and calls us to emulate him in our Christian friendships. Jesus is the perfect friend and calls us to emulate him in our Christian friendships. There is no doubt that companionship of the Lord is Paul's foremost comfort in his prison cell. We will always have Christ's companionship in life, and specifically in suffering. Remember, Jesus is the perfect pattern of perseverance and suffering. The Lord helps, the Lord's help comes at times through the care of human friendships, but a Christ-like friendship strives to point us to the fact that the Lord's presence is enough to comfort us. Paul's letter do a beautiful job in reminding us of this provision through the various examples of friendships that refreshed Paul in his life. Examples like Onesiphorus, Priscilla and Aquila, and of course Timothy. In contrast, though, we have examples of abandonment, like Demas, and also of times when Paul must complete his mission, his mission alone, like when he was alone on his first defense. John Mark's and Paul's reconciliation gives us hope for the strengthening of the unity of the body of Christ, specifically as we persevere in the marathon of racial reconciliation. Let these examples bolster your resolve and most importantly, remind you that the Holy Spirit gives us the power to finish the race. When we are lonely and troubled in spirit, we need our friends. When we are cold, we need a sweater. And when we need to pass time, we like to read books. So don't be afraid to admit admit these human needs. Don't think them unspiritual. Instead, let them remind you that we rely on Jesus to provide for us every need, including the ones that remind us of our humanity. We have come to the third section. Let's start by reading 2 Timothy 4, 16 through 21. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Prisca and Aquila in the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained at Corinth, and I left Trophimus, who was ill, at Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus sends greetings to you, as do Pudens and Linus and Claudia, and all the brothers. Amen. This is the word of God. Henry J. Nowen writes in his book, Bread for the Journey, When we strive to become like Jesus, we cannot expect always to be liked and admired. We have to be prepared to be rejected. This quote helps tie the section we just discussed with this third section. In verse 16, we see that Paul feels abandoned, deserted, and alone. He says, at my first offense, no one came to stand by me. Not even one. Roman law would have allowed for Paul to employ an advocate and even call witnesses, but at his hearing, his friends were absent. Some couldn't come because they were away, but others must have been afraid and did not show. He felt the rejection. 
He felt the emptiness, and he wanted Timothy to know that he felt it all and that it saddened him. Again, letting us into the humanness of an apostle that sometimes we want to make into a super person. I see myself in Paul's words. I'm convicted of my tendency to stay in my comfort zone instead of being present with those who suffer. We have abandoned our friends and fellow co-workers in Christ at times, haven't we? I want you to invite, I want to invite you to walk with me and sit for a bit beside a deep pool of grief. This grief, unacknowledged systemic racism, has been a lifelong companion for me. For years now, it has spurred me to do heart work with the Holy Spirit as my guide and counselor. I know that the overwhelming amount of information you have received over the last few months may have tired you, but I ask you, please listen with an open heart. As a member of the body of Christ, I acknowledge that I too have abandoned you, black brothers and sisters, in your fight against racism. And for this, I'm sorry and will continue to stand with you even when it gets hard. Now, we as the church can't ignore the call any longer. We must take the calling to do the work of repentance, reconciliation, and restoration alongside our black and brown brothers and sisters in love. This is the work of the kingdom, to be reconciled with Christ first through repentance and then be reconciled to each other through the power of the Holy Spirit. Again, this is the work of the kingdom, to be reconciled with Christ first through repentance and then be reconciled through e to each other through the power of the Holy Spirit. Like Paul, we are not expected to do this in our own power and without rejection. I encourage you to persevere in love and reconciliation. Remember, we follow Jesus first. His word is the lamp to our feet, and the Holy Spirit is our guide. To our black brothers and sisters, I also encourage you to persevere and remember Jesus Christ. He is your rescue when you find yourself alone, oppressed, or even abandoned by the church like Paul was. God will never leave you. Paul's comfort came from the presence of Jesus with him in the midst of being abandoned by his ministry partners and friends. In this abandonment, Paul did not become embittered, but instead imitated Christ, his perfect pattern in suffering. Paul's memory of the first time he met a servant of Christ in death could have also come back to mind. Jesus, like Stephen, the first martyr of the church, prayed to the Lord for their killers. May it not be charged against them. Paul is included in that them, isn't he? The robes of those stoning Stephen were at Paul's feet. And so now Paul shows mercy for those who abandon him and prays for them. Because he understands that sometimes we will have to walk the way the Lord has given us by ourselves, but not alone. In verse 17, he says, But the Lord stood by me and strengthened me, so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed, and all the Gentiles might, might hear it. So I was rescued from the lion's mouth. He was not alone. The Lord was close by, and in his presence, Paul was meditating on Psalm 22. Again, imitating Christ. This was the same scripture that the Lord had cried out to God with and, to, and had used to comfort himself in his death. Let's look specifically at verse 21. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. We see here that just like his Lord, Paul is strengthened by the Spirit through the Word of God. Even though Paul's hearing could have been in the presence of the emperor himself with a large crowd watching, Paul's inner strength 
despite the lack of support, came straight from the indwelling Holy Spirit. He preached the gospel even during his defense so that the Gentiles present could also hear it. He may have thought of Daniel in the lion's den, as I was reminded of studying Daniel with some of you in a previous summer study. The impossibility of Daniel's situation could have strengthened him to know that the faithfulness of God would not let him down now because he knew the end of the story. It could be that he would be rescued from evil being done against him now. But even if he didn't, the Lord would definitely bring him safely into his heavenly kingdom. He takes a moment to praise God, even in jail. And he has done that before in Acts. He has praised God when I think I may have wanted to curl up in a ball and cry. Let's look at verse 22, at the, at verse 22 of Psalm 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. This is what Paul is doing in verse 18 of 2 Timothy. He is praising in the midst of the congregation with the peace that surpasses understanding. Paul says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Maybe you are deep in the midst of suffering so intense you can barely breathe. Maybe you feel like your friends have abandoned you and the possibility of reconciliation seems impossible. Maybe you are awaiting an answer and all you hear is silence. Praise him anyway. Paul was about to die and he praised God anyway. Let's take a moment to do just that. Take a moment to write a sentence or a praise to the God who will rescue you and bring you safely to his heavenly kingdom. As Paul is drawing his letter to a close, he is immersed in remembering the faithfulness of the Lord. And this also leads him to remember the faithful co-workers that are still in Ephesus. We see in verse 19 that he sends them a personal greeting. For Prisca and Aquila to hear from their longtime friend would definitely refresh their hearts. And we come full circle again. The significance of Paul's friendship with Onesiphorus was so important that Paul mentions him again and asks Timothy to give his greetings to Onesiphorus' household. Paul lingers a bit more in verse 20 and 21. Do you do that when you go to a longtime friend's home? I picture him standing at the door and saying, oh, I almost forgot to tell you, Erastus is still in Corinth, also Trophimus is ill in Miletus, Eubulus, Pudens, and Claudia, and the brothers and sisters send you their greetings. But please don't wait until winter comes. Come before. I am waiting for you. Of the brothers and sisters sending greetings to Timothy, we don't know much. But because we serve a God who doesn't do anything in an arbitrary way, I want you to take a moment and reread their names. Eubulus, Pudens, Claudia. These unknown faithful believers did not go unnoticed by God. He knew them just as he knows you. The church is built not just on the visible leaders, but also on the faithful brothers and sisters that may not be known to us, but are known to God. I believe this is why Paul makes a point in mentioning people in his letters. We don't read the scriptures as stories of made-up characters, but of real people who persevered until the end and poured out their lives for the gospel. The Lord does not overlook you. That role that you faithfully do without recognition is a sweet fragrance to the Lord. Be encouraged. Continue and do not grow weary in doing good. For at the right time, you will receive your reward. This leads us to our third main truth. Praising the Lord will help us persevere in our heavenly race. Praising the Lord will help us persevere in our heavenly race. 
deep breath and exhale, right? We can rest in the Lord's faithfulness and provision and silence our hustle through praise. Not only have we come to the end of this study, but we have also come to a crossroads. We cannot live life in the same way as before. We must choose the way of Jesus. We have a fourfold charge regarding the gospel through Paul and 2 Timothy. We must guard it because it's valuable treasure. We must suffer for the gospel because it will cause the proud to stumble and come against us. We must persevere in it because it is God's truth revealed to us. And we must proclaim the gospel because it is the good news that this world needs to be saved. The letter of Paul ends with a benediction. The word benediction comes from the Latin meaning good words. A benediction is a short invocation for divine help, blessing, and guidance. This is a very important part of the letter. Don't give in to the temptation to skip it or ignore it. In these last verses, in this very last verse, Paul says, the Lord be with your spirit. This phrase grounds all that Paul has been telling Timothy in this letter. We are to be people about the presence of the Lord primarily. The very heart of grace is that God becomes our everything so that we can be saved from our sin, proclaim the gospel, endure through suffering to finish the race. Paul reminds Timothy of this by speaking a blessing over him, and then he says, Grace be with you. In the Greek, the word you is plural. So Paul wrote the letter for Timothy, but he also wrote it for the church. That is us. We are included and can partake of this blessing too. Because of the grace of God that has been given freely to us, we can count the cost and be brave heralds of the gospel. The Lord is with you, and his grace will strengthen your spirit to remain faithful in proclaiming his gospel until the end. Timothy was called to be faithful in his generation. Where are the brothers and sisters who will be faithful in ours? Rise up, sisters. Even if you feel inadequate, remember the blessing that Paul spoke over you. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. So let's imitate Paul as we receive the unmerited grace God gives. Let's offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. And then let's give him the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Dear God, you are kind again and again. Your patience with us is overwhelming. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be bound to you in grace. May your word continue to transform our hearts and make us more like Jesus. May your word continue to give us all that we need in this life. I pray that as my sisters go in the power of your word, they will be restored and strengthened by your spirit. Because trials surely await and joys also come through your word. Lord, come soon. Help us. We need your help. This hurting world needs your good news. You are a God who is about restoration and, recon and reconciliation. Forgive us for the sin of racism, for the sin of apathy, and let us not stay the same, but instead let us not grow weary of doing good. Thank you that you rescue us from the lion's mouth and from our own sin so that we can be made righteous with you. Oh, Jesus, we cannot get enough of you. Go with us. We need your presence forever. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.